Colonel, how are you? I am well, sir. Yes, we're just saying you, you're in Texas. Correct. So, um, I, I always think of, do you remember the, the TV show Dallas? I do. That was a long time ago, as you recall, Chris. <laughs> yeah, that was really, really popular at the time, wasn't it? It certainly was. Mm. It was incredibly popular. Uh, did you, well, um, when you, when you served in the military, uh, was that in Texas or was that all over the U.S.? Well, I spent several years in Texas. About half of my career was spent in Texas. We were four years at Brook Army Medical Center at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, and then eight years at Fort Hood in Texas in the clean area, which is about midway between Dallas and um, San Antonio. What made you want to join the military uh, or, or the medical profession? Well, the medical profession, that's an interesting story. I'll start with that. I, I was interested in science growing up. I was, a, I was a very good student. And people would tell me going through into junior high, late junior high and into high school, you should be a doctor. You should be a doctor. And I'm thinking, I don't want to be a doctor. They work too hard. I was thinking about something along the lines of physical therapy or a physio, uh, something along that lines, physical therapy, something physiology, something along that lines. And then as I got towards the end of high school, in late junior year into my senior year, I'm thinking, well, it's a much easier step to go from physical therapy to medicine rather than vice versa. So I thought, hmm. I think there's some merit to that. And I decided to go pre-med in, into college. And in terms of the Army and applying for scholarships, I received an Army ROTC scholarship. And my college career started off at the University of Notre Dame. And so I was on a four-year Army ROTC scholarship at the University of Notre Dame. So that was my first exposure. And I remember you talking with one of your guests and you spend a lot of time talking about your airborne jumps and airborne school. And it reminded me of going to airborne school <laughs> after my freshman year of college. So, oh, so you've jumped too. Well, I, I made five jumps. So I, I qualified. I've got to get this right on the camera. I qualified. So I, I did get my airborne wings, but I never made any combat jumps. Mm. Yeah, I like talking about my parachute course because quite a lot of time in my military career was very boring. But when it was good, it was really good. And the parachute course was to get paid to do something that was so much fun. <laughs> it's, it's just, I, I, you can't really put it into words. So that, that's kind of why I like talking about, I like talking about it. Um, you know, yeah, I, I'm with you. It's it's something that was a lot of fun, and I attended almost on a whim. I had some upperclassmen; they were going to attend airborne school and then go on to ranger school. And they asked me, "Skip, do you want to go to airborne school?" I thought about it for probably 20 seconds, no more than 30 seconds, certainly. Hmm, that sounds like that might be fun. Mm. And yeah, sure. I called up my mom and dad, said, Mom, Daddy, -o, I think I'm going to go to airborne school and made preparations to go with them down to Fort Benning, Georgia to attend airborne school, not giving any thought to, you know, this could be a little dangerous. You know, you might get her injured. You could, you know, it's potentially lethal, you know, a bad jump. You know that. I know that. <laughs> But it seemed like a fun thing to do as an 18-year-old kid. I hadn't had my 19th birthday yet. And so I went. I did have one jump that was a little bit perilous. I, I didn't pull my risers correctly uh, towards the end to do my PLF, my parachute landing fall. Mm. And so my jump, I landed, boom, and then on my butt, bam, and then my head, bam. 
and, and uh, landed with enough force that it broke the, the rings on my Kevlar, just broke them. <laughs> and I'm laying there stunned, laying on the ground thinking, oh, man, I got to get up. I got to get up. I got to get up. And uh, yet I'm stunned there thinking, uh, so this is running through my mind. Get up, Skip. Get up. You got to get up. But at the same time, I, I'm, I was so stunned I couldn't get up. And the thoughts running through my mind, if I don't get up, the jump master is going to disqualify me and I'm going to get recycled. <laughs> Laying there on my back, seeing stars, thinking, get up, get up, gather your chute so you can run off the field. <laughs> and I managed to do so. And then I had to go get my Kevlar replaced. So that was the only perilous jump that I had. I did have a buddy, a good buddy of mine, Dave Ristet, and he... He and I kind of followed, or either he almost followed my uh, career in terms of my uh, duty stations and positions that I had been in. And he served under me with the uh, 21st Combat Support Hospital in Iraq. And then later, Dave would go on to command the 21st. But he was getting ready to, he had just stepped into position as the 101st uh, Airborne uh, Surgeon. And Dave wasn't airborne qualified. And he knew he didn't need to be airborne qualified, but he decided, well, since I'm with this uh, group, I, I should be, oh, it wasn't there 80 for 100 first. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon. It was the 82nd uh, at Fort Bragg. And so he decides he's going to attend airborne school. And uh, on his second jump, he has a bad landing, fractures, his lower leg, both the, the tibia and the fibula, both bones. So I get this frantic call from his his wife. Oh, Dave broke his leg. Coming through town on our way to Fort Benning. He's going to have emergency surgery. No, Dave was almost 50 years old at that point. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. But, as you know, it's a, it's a young man's game. You know, it's not for... 50 year olds to be jumping out of planes. <laughs> Did you, um, do you just jump from the airplane? Is it the C-130? It was a C-130. So, you, so you're attached uh, mm -hmm. uh, with that. And I, I remember that uh, first jump. So, so it's with the static line, correct? And so we're standing there in line and I'm cool and everybody's cool. We're sitting there. And, and for some reason, you know how they get you there early, early, early in the morning, and, you know, oh, before sunrise, and you're waiting to load up. And, and this day, the winds or something were off, and so the plane is just circling and circling and circling before things are finally it lands and we get loaded up. And by then, it's, it's mid-morning, and you know, we've been sitting in the sun for hours. We load up, but everybody's relaxed and so forth and we get in we're all in the plane you know waiting and of course you know makes its circle to the right place on the field the door is open <laughs> you hear that rush of wind all right the jump master says stand up hook up and you're starting to shuffle towards the door you know everybody checks everybody you know and you start going towards the door well i'm in the number man two position i'm cool as cucumber up to this point and as soon as i step to turn into the door and take my position. My legs turn like jelly. <laughs> I don't know what that exit looked like. <laughs> yeah. You think about that now, but I make the exit, you know, take, assume the position, but count and then look up. Boom. There's that beautiful parachute. It's like, Oh, <laughs> I think about that every time, how cool is a cucumber until I step into that door and then my, my legs are like spaghetti. And what, Skip, what decides um, what unit you go to? Do you go to, are you, do you serve with a medical unit or do you? Exactly, exactly. So my route to come on active duty is a little bit circuitous. So I start off ROTC, but I end up leaving the University of Notre Dame. So it terminated my scholarship so I did not go back to school till three years later at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma, 
And so I wasn't on scholarship at that time until I started medical school. And that was on a army scholarship, what's called an HPSP scholarship, health profession, um, the scholarship program, the HPSP. And so with four years of scholarship, I owed the army four years. Mm -hmm. And then after medical school, I, I did not get an army internship for a variety of reasons. So I did a civilian internship with the intention of coming back on active duty, but it just so happened my training uh, director, my program director was retired Brigadier Gen General, uh, Dr. Andre Ognabin, most amazing clinical teacher, medical educator I've ever seen, bedside clinician, just incredible. I wanted to train under him. So we, he arranged a deferment to come on active duty so I could finish my training with him. And then I came on active duty. So yes, the army then decides where they're going to place you and you're assigned to medical units. Now, in some cases, those medical units might be directly associated with uh, field units, like the, the 21st Combat Support Hospital or the uh, um, 82nd Airborne Division in, in certain positions uh, there. But I was assigned initially to Reynolds Army Community Hospital in Lawton, Oklahoma. Did you specialize in, in any role in the medical world? Yes, I am a internal medicine specialist. So a specialist for adults. Okay. And Skip, what's the difference or what did you find the differences were being in peacetime and then being in, 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 a, in a war zone? A few differences that immediately come to mind, Chris, are the, the pace in war time, in peacetime, you are, the, the pace is very, very busy day in and day out. So my first duty station at Fort Sill was one of those where I did both ambulatory medicine, outpatient medicine, and inpatient medicine, and, and did both concurrently. And so very, very busy, incredibly busy. Uh, taking care of patients in both uh, facets and uh, taking care of active duty, taking care of retirees and taking care of family members of retirees in some cases. So taking care of full spectrum of adults. And you think about young soldiers that you're taking care of, they might be as young as 17 year olds if they got a deferment to get into the army and taking care of the elderly individuals that could be into their 80s and 90s that I'm taking care of. So as an internal medicine specialist, that's our scope of the training to take care of the very young adult, somebody with a common cold or a ambulatory pneumonia to the individual that's hooked up on a life support equipment in the ICU or end of life issues. We that's the scope that we treat. Wow. So, so very, very busy uh, on an ongoing basis, basically, unless you're on leave, you know, it's busy when um, during peacetime. And you always have the availability of specialists that you can contact, you can uh, quickly um, get information from for consultation. Now in wartime that uh, you will have bursts where you're real busy and then lulls where you're sitting around. And so you're kind of waiting, but you're always on edge in, in a combat zone. There's always that uh, heightened sense that something can happen at any time. So even though you have those lulls, there's always this sense that something could happen and so there's this heightened sense of awareness. And then when things do happen, you know, they're happening very rapidly. And it's not unusual then to have a mass casualty where you have your medical system, if you will, is overwhelmed or, or pushed to the brink of its capabilities. And so you're having to do things in rapid fire situations in terms of triage and treatment, and in some cases, then 
evacuation very rapidly or within 24 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, um, that you're having then to evacuate patients back uh, farther in theater or back even to Europe, CONUS, continental US. So those, those are some of the differences. But in terms of the medical, medical care delivered, world-class in both situations, world-class. What's your connection with wrestling? Because I know that features ah. <laughs> heavily in your life. My connection with wrestling. Oh, thank you for asking, Chris. <laughs> because you, you are an ultra marathoner and you've done all these things. So uh, you're uh, quite the accomplished athlete. I've done a few things, but... Yeah, just a few, right, Chris? Just a few. <laughs> My connection with wrestling started in eighth grade. I was typically the smallest kid in my class, bullied as a child, and miserable at any sport I tried. I didn't know how to throw, kick, catch uh, a ball. I didn't know how to run, really. I, I, was, I wasn't strong. I wasn't fast. I wasn't coordinated. I didn't have an older brother to show me those things. My father was ill after coming back from the Korean War. So he really wasn't a, a part of our lives. He would come to visit from time to time, but spent really spent his uh, years after the war in and out of, of Veterans Administration's hospital being treated until he died when I was 13. Now, uh, so I, I was just miserable. At any sport. I don't know if you're familiar with tetherball, Chris. Uh, you'll have to remind us. Tetherball, you have a rope tied to a pole. So you have yeah. pole, yeah. 10, I don't know, maybe 10 foot tall. And the rope is a tied to a, to a ball, mm. maybe this big. It's almost like a soccer ball with a ring uh, attached to it, uh, all inclusive with the ball, and then the rope is tied to it and then it attaches to the top of the of the pole and the purpose is you have two players and the purpose is you're hitting the ball back and forth and you're trying to wrap the ball the rope around the ring while one is trying to wrap it one way the other is trying to get it wrapped the other way i failed at tetherball that's what i tell people i was that uh, I remember our fourth grade teacher taking us out to test us on chin ups for the boys and bent arm hang for time for the girls. I couldn't do one chin up. It was just horrible. But in eighth grade, I discovered wrestling. It was the first time I ever uh, went out for a sport. And after a practice, I thought, hmm, I think I might be good at this. After a couple of practices, hmm, I think I could. Maybe they're really good at this. And I made the varsity team, the only eighth grader to be on the varsity team. Didn't win a match that year, but I could beat a lot of kids in that wrestling room. The next year, I was really the best kid in the wrestling room, but I get so worked up the night before a match. I didn't get a week of sleep the night before. And I'd just be exhausted going into that wrestling match mentally, emotionally, and physically. And and win another match. And to, so it wasn't until the summer after that I won my first freestyle wrestling tournament and then continued on to have a lot of wrestling success. Finished my career as a two time district champion, state runner up, won multiple state uh, freestyle tournaments, one of the rest, uh, Olympic styles, uh, placed in two national freestyle uh, uh, wrestling tournaments. And Ended up my career as a all uh, honorable mention all American. Wow! Congratulations. And then at the age of fifty six, I got the competition bunk again. So I asked my eighteen year old son to train with me, and he agreed to do so. In fact, his words were, "Okay, Dad, but you're going to have to do everything I say." So my son Joey trained with me. He was my workout partner my trainer, and my coach. And we went to Tucson, Arizona, and we won a national wrestling championship. Incredible. 
So, and then the next year I was the national runner up. So that's an, that's I've had, a, a, I've had a love affair with wrestling. I have four younger brothers. They all wrestled. My father-in-law was a wrestler. My brother-in-law was a wrestler. Two of my uh, best buddies from high school, you know, were wrestlers and we still keep them in close contact. Um, uh, I, my kids call me a wrestling groupie because I'm the kind of guy that I befriended national champions, world champions, Olympic champions, uh, you know, get photos with them. I have wrestling cards that I get signed. I have my wrestling books that I get signed. <laughs> oh, it's, it's great to have a passion in life. Absolutely. What do you, what's your, um, uh, your understanding or what, what do you make of the fo fox catcher story? Oh, the fox catcher story with Dave Schultz. Tragic. Mm. Tragic. This man, Dave Schultz, uh, was an icon in our sport. Still is. And remembered with such affection and such honor. Dave was called by many as you listen to those who talk about Dave, who competed with Dave, who trained with Dave, who knew Dave as a savant, as somebody who basically could see a move or somebody could show him a move and Dave could do that move. He had this uncanny ability to quickly learn and master things. And he was tough. They said Dave was the nicest guy off the mat. But he was tough. Kenny Monday, who competed against Dave and actually beat him out of uh, that Olympic slot. And then Kenny went on to be an Olympic gold and then silver medalist. You know, just talked about how tough Dave was uh, and what a nice guy, Dave. And there's this photo, actually, of when Kenny won. That was the Seoul Olympics. Was that 80? That would have been 88, I believe. Dave Schultz had gone and trained with uh, Kenny and it shows Dave carrying Kenny on his shoulders as he paraded him around the wrestling mat after Kenny won that gold medal in Seoul. But Dave, uh, you know, with uh, DuPont, DuPont was just a strange man by all accounts, everybody. Mark Schultz talks about it and others talk about that. Uh, DuPont had this inflated sense of who he was and wanted to be around these greats. And this was a weird man and just went off the rails, you know, shot Dave, unfortunately snuffed his life out. And we lost this great man from our sport. Yes. It, it's, it's, um, it's horrifying to watch the, they made a film about it, didn't they? A movie, and but but recently the the actual sort of documentary's been out, and yeah, they they made a film, and they also um, Mark uh, Schultz wrote a book uh, about it. In fact, I probably have my copy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh wow! Uh, so Mark. Mark wrote that book. Yeah. Outlines the story, a lot of interviews, a lot of things, a lot of details. It's what's the relevance of the name Foxcatcher? Uh, I'm not quite sure how they got that name, or if that was just the name of the property that DuPont owned there, or if that was the name of the wrestling program. I don't remember the significance of that kit chris mm. yeah i was just trying to think um uh just what one second um uh, i'm trying to think of the 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 mixed martial art girl the champion for many years um but her background was was wrestling. Mixed martial arts girl, yeah. you say? Yeah. What's the big tournament called? The UFC, isn't it? Right, 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 right. Um, I'm just Rousey. 
Ronda Rousey, is that? Yeah, Ronda, of course it was. Yeah, Sorry, Ronda I was just was, having a, um, having a, a great moment. Yeah, I don't think it was, is it wrestling? I thought Ronda had a little bit different. I think hers was judo. Ah. Her background was judo. Yes. Right. Yeah, she had this move where she'd get her opponent in an arm lock, and then it was game over every every single time. Yeah. So Ronda's was judo. Yeah, she was a judo player. Judo, before, oh, okay. Yeah, before she went into the UFC. Do you think... Um, Do you think every young person should get involved in some form of martial art? Hmm. That's a good question, Chris. I know for me, it was a lifesaver in terms of the confidence it gave me, the, uh, how it, it really changed my whole identity. Because as I said, I was a very small child. I was bullied and it, it changed things because after, after wrestling, I was never bullied anymore. I wasn't any bigger. It's still me. Mm. You know, these guys didn't mess with me any longer. And my brothers and I kind of joke around, where are the bullies now? Bring them on. But so I think there's some merit to that because it gives you confidence. It and that confidence, what it does, you carry yourself differently. You think of yourself differently. Bullies, uh, what I tell people is bullies have this homing device. It's, it's like they can sense blood in the water. And they don't pick out somebody who carries themselves with confidence. They don't pick out somebody who, who is going to fight back. They pick out somebody they know who is vulnerable and isn't going to fight back. That's who bullies choose to bully. And so I think when you are involved in something like that, it gives you an air of confidence. It gives yeah. you a sense of confidence. It gives you self-control. And guess what? I think it then the bully sees something differently in you. And you're not an easy target. They are looking for easy targets. So I think for children, especially in this day and age, when people bully one another, and unfortunately they do it uh, uh, without having to be face-to-face -face when we were growing up. If you wanted to bully someone, guess what? <laughs> you had to do it in person. Now they can do it through this medium. Unfortunately, and all too often it's done that way, but it gives people that, I think that added boost that added confidence. So I think there is some merit to that, Chris, whether, yeah. whether you actually ever have to use it. I haven't been in a fight you know, since, since then, but if I had to get in one, I think I could handle myself because if I get that opponent down on the ground, and that's what wrestlers want to do. We want to take the fight to the ground. Guess what? <laughs> You're going to be in trouble. And it's, it's crazy, Skip, because when our generation grew up, it, it was all about the physical fight. Right. But now we're coming to realize that men face a much tougher battle on a what much wider scale, and it's more. It's going to affect. M m whereas m most people rarely get in a fight, maybe a few when you're a kid. This is something that affects most adults, or or very many, and of course, it's it's mental health. Yes, indeed. And this is your specialist field, right? Well, certainly, um, help helping men overcome depression. Am I right there? Correct. That's correct, Chris. And how did it come about? Well, this is born out of my own experience with depression. My last year in the army, I suffered major depression. 
And as I began to recover, I was called to help other men who were struggling with depression. Do you know what brought on your depression? Yes, in, in retrospect, and of course, at the time, I would have thought it was the perfect storm of the events that were going on right there. And certainly it was those, but it was also the accumulated trauma that had gone on through my life that I had not taken time to process. So it was all that accumulated trauma heaped on now with that perfect storm of those events that took place those last 18 months that I was in the army that just broke me. Mm -hmm. So when you think about accumulated trauma, I had a very traumatic childhood. My father came back a broken man from the Korean War. My, my Auntie Mary, his older sister, my older cousins, even my mother say the man that went to war is not the man that came home. He suffered mental illness. I'm convinced was bipolar disorder, PTSD, and he was an alcoholic. And when he drank, he was violent. And so my sister, Roma, my oldest sister, she tells us that when my dad would come home, we would run and hide because we didn't know which dad was coming home. The kind, gentle, fun, loving dad or the violent, angry dad. I don't have those memories, but my sister, Roma, does. So that was the childhood. And as I said, my dad would just come home to visit for short periods, was but really not a part of my life for most of my childhood. And then, uh, thank goodness for my mom, most amazing, one of the most amazing women I know, and her strength and courage to raise eight children, go back to school, get her degree, start teaching. And then my little grandma, my abuelita, as we call in Spanish, meaning the little grandma, who came to live with us at the age of 63 to help raise eight children to allow my mother to go back to school and lived with us till she died uh, at the age of 93. So for 30 years, grandma lived with us, but she raised really, for the most part, raised us with mom going back to school and then after mom was remarried, but amazing, amazing women that stepped in. And then my daddy -o, who my mother remarried when I was 12 and a half. And again, those things changed my life, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so, but the accumulated trauma, dad, dad, and that traumatic childhood, the uncertainty, the chaos, just a lot of chaos there deaths, my, my dad's death, later my daddy's death, my abuelita's death. I had an uncle who committed suicide. I had an uncle who was shot and killed, I had a cousin who was shot and killed. You don't process those things, but you know, all of that stacks up. And then the things you deal with in medicine, uh, patients dying, uh, accidents occurring in the army where you're dealing with deaths, or you're treating critically ill soldiers or mangled bodies, um, and you don't process that. You just go on picking up and taking care of patients because you're so busy, and suicides, uh, charred and burned bodies in some cases, and all that trauma that accumulates that you don't process. Uh, and I could go on and on. So mm -hmm. the thing as a physician, the things as a person, the things as a army physician. And so these things just stack upon one another. Then my last uh, several months in the army, uh, preparing to leave the army, I had three surgeries in seven months, all fraught with complications, unfortunately, that just disrupted my normal routine. Uh, diet, exercise, um, sleep, and insomnia started to be the first thing that affected me. And that just quickly got worse. And then some things were going on in my department that uh, I took responsibility for that were going to affect graduate medical, graduate medical education and patient care that 
again, I couldn't control, but I took it personally and then began to have these negative thoughts. You've let your department down. You've let the army down. You've let your family down. You're a fake. You don't deserve to be a colonel. Who's going to want to hire you? You're a failure. And then these negative thoughts just start playing over and over and over and over in your mind. In medical terms, you call these negative ruminations like a, a ruminator, like a cow that brings up its cud, chews it and swallows it again. Just play over day and night. And then lost my confidence, became indecisive. Um, my cognition was off. Could remember what I what I read five minutes before. I just read. What was that? Mm -hmm. I, uh, I thought I had early onset dementia that I actually requested to be tested. Um, could recall names of medications. It's like what was the name of that? Ah. You no, know, it was there. It's like running through the files in my brain, but couldn't find that file. Uh, it was, and things just got worse. And then my mood just began to go down into the toilet. And then it finally came to a head on April 17, 2013. When you were in this downward cycle, did you realize what was happening to you or did it all just seem uh, almost like a normal evolution of your life. No, I knew I was struggling, Chris, uh, but I didn't. Uh, I didn't realize that it was depression. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew I felt horrible. I knew I was struggling. The insomnia had become horrendous. Where some nights I was sleeping an hour or two a night. Other nights I was just waking up six, eight. 10 times a night, I was up and down, up and down, or the nights I could fall asleep, I'd sleep a few hours, then bing, I'd be wide awake and couldn't get back to sleep. Um, so I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know what was wrong. I knew I felt horrible. I attributed it to the stress, I attributed it to uh, the insomnia, I attributed it to uh, worrying about getting out of the army and a lot of uncertainty in my life at that time the disruption because of the surgeries, et cetera. But I couldn't put the pieces together. Mm. I couldn't step back and see, oh, this is what's going on. And I didn't have the insight to step back enough and say, oh, maybe I should go talk to somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should go get help because of that tough guy mentality. I'm a tough guy. I'm a wrestler. I'm a soldier. I'm a colonel. I've been in combat zones. I'm a caregiver. You know, all these things that define me as a tough guy. And what do tough guys do? In, a, in wrestling, we have this term, gut it out, where no matter how hard it is, and you're an ultra marathoner, you can relate to that. You've done these hard physical things. No matter how hard your lungs are burning, how much your muscles ache, how much your brain is telling you, stop, just stop. Mm. You just push through it. You just push through it. You just push through it. Well, that can get you through a lot of things, that mentality. But it's this double-edged sword too, you know, how it, how it can affect you. And the worse I got, the harder I tried. And the harder I tried, the worse I got, you know. And I couldn't step back to see what was going on. And it, as I said, it finally came to a head on April 17, 2014, when I went to my office. I always got there early before anybody else, typically before anybody else on the whole floor. I go to my office, unlocked it, turned on the lights, stepped inside, and just felt like everything just came bah, crashing down. I turned around, locked the door, Turned off the lights, drew the blinds, turned off the phones, and then I crawled up under my desk in a fetal position. And for four hours, I wrestled with those questions. Skip, what are you doing? Skip, how did you get here? What happened? I'm thinking to myself, you're this tough guy, Skip. 
You're a national wrestling champion. You're a colonel. You've been in war zones. You've done all these different things. How did you get here? And it took four hours uh, of reliving these things and seeing, you know, there's trauma and things going on. And to finally put all the pieces together to understand, oh, insomnia, blue mood, impaired cognition, loss of confidence, indecision, impaired libido, impaired sex drive, you know, on and on I could go with symptoms uh, there. And finally being able to put it together that after four hours, it's, oh, skip, you're depressed. Go get help. Hmm. Did you get help then? I did. I crawled out from under that desk. I had a flicker of hope. And I initially went down to our the primary care physician, my primary care physician's uh, clinic, asked us when was the first appointment I could get with the clinical psychologist there. They said, well, next week I made that appointment, got back to my office and I said, I don't want to wait that long. So I called the chief of behavioral health <laughs> and explained the situation and said, can I, can you get me an appointment? And later that afternoon, I was seeing a clinical psychologist and she uh, verified the diagnosis of major depression. Wow. And and what helped you to get out of that skip? Well, I started seeing a clinical psychologist, a therapist. So every week I was seeing a therapist. So I was getting therapy. Um, he recommended I see my primary care physician just to have a thorough evaluation and make sure there weren't any secondary causes, certain medical diseases, hypothyroidism, uh, low thyroid uh, um, other medical conditions can contribute to depression. Uh, so I saw her, she ruled out all those causes, said, no, Dr. Mondragon, I don't see any of this. I recommend we start you on a medication. What do you think? I said, I think that would be a good idea. <laughs> so I started an antidepressant. And then later I was seeing a psychiatrist also. So it was the combination of that. And then I tell people my F3, my family, my friends, and my faith, that all three of those were essential in helping me recover. Mm. And in what kind of context do people come to you now for help? Do you have like ah. a, 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 I mean, a, a practice or... or no, I'm not in a practice per se. I, I do write. I, uh, out, out of my experience, I, I did write a book. Mm. But let me just step back a minute because the first time I shared about my experience, um, it was before I left Eisenhower Army Medical Center. That was my last duty station where all of this cure occurred before we retired out of the Army. And what led up to that was, it's was about six weeks into my recovery, and my brother Chris, my youngest brother, I have four younger brothers, had called me, very excited, and he said, Skip, I just attended a Bible study with Franklin Graham, this is son of Billy Graham, evangelist Billy Graham, who had, uh, was there in Raleigh, North Carolina, and led a Bible study about suffering, the suffering of Christ. And the gist of it was, if Christ suffered so brutally upon the cross for us, why should we think we're immune from suffering? And Chris called and shared that, and it convicted me. And I thought, hmm, I'm suffering. Mm -hmm. And it brought to mind a verse out of Philippians, Philippians 3.10, Oh, that I might know him, referring to Christ, that Paul is writing, and the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings. I knew that verse. I'd prayed that verse hundreds of times. Mm. But when I was suffering, my prayers were, Lord, please, please, please deliver me from my darkness. And over two days' time, my prayer shifted from, Lord, please, please, 
please deliver me from my darkness to Lord. What would you have me learn? And how might I use this to help others? And that was an epiphany, if you will, and a pivotal switch. Because then it helped me take meaning with this suffering. And I knew I was going to have to share my message. I knew I must share my message. And so I began to make notes of what I had learned, what I was learning with the intent that I was going to share it, not knowing when or how that was going to occur, but I knew I was going to. And so before I left the army, I asked our commander of the hospital if I could share my message. He gave me an opportunity, what was called an officer's professional development day in the hospital auditorium where all the staff, hospital staff could come, uh, not just the physicians, but all the hospital staff. There was an offering in the morning and there's another time in the afternoon, an hour that I had to share my story, lessons learned, with the intent of dealing uh, attacking the stigma related to mental illness, encouraging others who were struggling to go and get help and to let them know excellent help was available to them. So that's when I first shared. And afterwards, there were people that came up and said, thank you for sharing. I've suffered with this same thing. I know somebody who has struggled with this. Thank you for having the courage to share. Mm -hmm. And it was out of that that I wrote, wrestling depression is not for wimps. And then I've spoken in various venues, sharing this story, and then talking to men to help them um, deal with this issue, to encourage them. You know, we can get through this. We've been acculturated in a way to be tough guys, but there's a real tough guy is one who can admit, I need help. I can't go it alone. We know that as former military guys. You can't go it alone. You need your battle buddy or battle buddies to help you. And yet, how often do we want to try as men to go it alone? And that's what I was trying to do. And even now, some of my uh, buddies say, gee, we didn't realize how much Skip was suffering. We had no idea because I was suffering in silence. That tough guy trying to do it on my own. Yes, it's impossible to know, isn't it? How much someone can be suffering because we, our natural default position is to just say, oh, everything's all right. Exactly. Mm. So how you doing? Oh, I'm fine, doing well. And so it behooves us to ask, no, how are you really doing? And Skip, what, what steps can people take to get themselves into a better mind state? Well, I think uh, the steps, uh, one of the things I talk about is, and I devoted a whole chapter in the book to, is prevention is better than rehab. And certainly as athletes, we understand that. <laughs> it's a lot better to prevent a chronic injury than it is to treat it. Yeah. So prevention is better than rehab. And so monitoring your, your status, knowing where your reserves, how they're doing, where they're at. How are you mentally? How are you emotionally? How are you doing socially? How are you doing spiritually? How are you doing physically? How are you doing on these different fronts? And if you're finding those areas where your energies in any of these areas are ebbing, how do, what do you need to do to shore them up? Because we are a united being. And if one area is hurting, the other areas in that being, in our being is going to hurt. And so monitoring yourself, prevention is better than rehab. Hmm. That's one. I think the other is having those battle buddies, maintaining those healthy relationships, individuals that you can talk to openly and be realistic to those people that you can be vulnerable with. 
and realize everybody is struggling in some way. Nobody's life is perfect. And I think as men, as they open up and begin to share, they'll realize there's so many, many others out there that are struggling with the same thing. Because the way we've been raised, don't be a crybaby, be a man. Real men don't cry. No, that's not true. We've been raised to believe that. And then you see the what's up on the media, you know, the, the tough guy, the macho man up there who hardly sheds a tear. And, you know, he's rough and tough and deals with these situations and oftentimes by himself. No, that's not reality. The real tough guy has these two dual sides. He can be tough, decisive, the provider, protector, uh, individual. And he can also be that tender, gentle, kind individual who can be vulnerable, shed tears. And so the two duality, that duality of a real tough guy or a real man, if you will, because if we only have the one side, that hard, tough, decisive provider protector type of individual we are not being a true tough guy and we're missing so much of who we really are and missing out in so much of life mm. and so i think it behooves us to help men to understand that so i think that's the other is we've got to attack those lies and men have to understand that's not really true and as you begin to open up with a trusted friend or two, you'll understand. They'll understand. Yeah, it's okay. Mm -hmm. It's okay to say, I'm hurt. And do you think it helps people to set some goals that are more appropriate to themselves as opposed to chasing the sort of perceived societal goals, career and, you know, big car or whatever the case may be? Well, that's a great, that's a great question. And I, I think there's a couple of ways of looking at, at that. I think we all need a purpose. We have to pursue something that's uh, significant and fulfills us. So that's one way of looking at that. What's that purpose you're seeking to fulfill? And I think each of us, God has given us a purpose to fulfill. And so what is that purpose that we are seeking to fulfill? That, I think, is overarching, if you will. But in terms of goals, now you can have uh, goals like an objective goal to, well, I want to make this much money or want to do this, but there's a different way of looking at that um, to, I want to give my best effort. I want to become uh, more involved in my family's life. I, I want to spend more time with my children. I, I want to be a kinder, gentler um, husband who can listen to my wife more attentively. I, I want to be more present when I'm with people I love. So I, I think that's an excellent question because the, the goal could be more so who do I want to become rather than what do I want to do? Because I think as we become more of the person we want to be, then we're going to see those other things will follow accordingly, but we'll be so much more fulfilled and we'll be able to contribute so much more and not be so frustrated in the pursuit of things. And I think that's where many times as men, we miss it because we compare ourselves with these other guys. Oh, look at the car he's driving. Oh, you know, look at the house they live in. You know, look where they're taking their family for vacation. You know, there, there's a variety of things. You know what I'm talking about, Chris. <laughs> and then listening to this, know what we're talking about. Rather than, wow, look at that 
what a loving husband he is, what a thoughtful husband he is. Look what an amazing uh, father he is, how attentive he is to his children. What a good friend he is. What a faithful friend he is. And how if when we can take our worth and identity more so in these things rather than, ooh, you know, I reached this financial goal. Those are all fine. But if those can become secondary to becoming the people we want to be, becoming the friends, uh, husbands, fathers, friends, sons that uh, we want to be. I think if we put emphasis on those things, it will go a long way. I think that's great advice. And Skip, where can we're going to put a, a link for your book below so that people can grab themselves a copy. How can they get hold of you if, they, if, if they're seeking your services? Yes. And, okay. and you, speak, you speak as well, obviously. Yes, indeed. Hmm. Yes, indeed, Chris. Uh, you're aware that I recently gave that TEDx talk, uh, Men Are Endangered Species. And I would encourage others to please go listen to that because, man, you'll hear more of my story. And I think you'll be encouraged by that. Certainly, men need to hear this story. Uh, right now at skip at wrestlingisnotforwimps.com. Soon that's going to switch over to skip at transformedtoughguys.com. In the next day or two, that will be the best place to reach me. Skip at transformtoughguys.com yeah we'll put links below and uh skip that just leaves me to say thank you ever so much sir it's really great to meet you i'm glad that our paths have crossed and i'm um, i'm happy that yours is um going in the right direction for you thank you chris it's been my delight it's good to meet you sir and thank you for all that you're doing on behalf of our brothers and sisters in the military. Yes, um, we, we can do our best, can't we? Yes, sir. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Indeed. Stay on the line so I can thank you properly. And to all our friends at home, I hope you got as much from that as I did. Much love to you all. If you can like and subscribe, that would be wonderful. And we'll see you next time.